Questions have been asked by uh, people along the way today, and there's uh, perhaps just one missing ingredient, which is the lecturer asking you questions. And I'm going to ask you uh, several questions along the way to complete, complete the communication cycle. So just to get you in practice, let's start off with a question about these cards here. I've got here one card that is red on both sides. I've got a card that is red on one side and white on the other. And I've got another card that is white on both sides. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle them and hide them from your view and randomly pick one of them. And I'm going to plonk it, plonk it down on the table. And we'll see what color you can see. And then I'm going to ask you a question. All right. So I shuffle the cards. And <laughs> we can have a volunteer do this if you want. I'm not cheating or anything. Um, and I pick one of them and I plonk it down there. Okay? And what you see is a red face. And now the question is you see red. What's the probability that the other face? Yeah. What's the probability that the other face is red? Have a chat to each other. I'm not going to give you very long because you've already had three lectures today on this and maybe you've all done courses on this. So, you see red, what's the probability that the other face is red? Now you get to vote. I get your feedback from you by having you vote on the options. So I'll give you three alternative answers to this question. What's the probability that it's red? Uh, one option is a half, one is two thirds, one is something else. And one is, I don't know, I'm not sure yet. Uh, give me a bit longer. And it, so I, I want you to vote. Everyone must vote for one of these options. And the first one you get to vote for, if you want, is Z. Who's voting for Z? OK. So two votes for Z. So that's useful feedback to me. It means I already gave you enough time um, to discuss the problem, because only two of you are uncertain about your answer. Great. Uh, votes for half, A. Eh? OK. That's about 50 people. <laughs> votes for <laughs> votes for B, two thirds. Okay, that's about seventy. Votes for something else. Okay, none. Good. This is interesting. So all of you are pretty damn certain, and you completely disagree with each other. <laughs> so let that's interesting because this is an inference problem. I gave you some data. You know, it's pretty clear what the. Um, the setup was, I told you I picked a card at random and I plonked it down at random. So I told you all the probabilities and it's an inference problem. What's going on on the other side? And the way you should solve inference problems, as you've been learning, is with Bayes' theorem. And so you should be thinking about this sort of stuff, priors, likelihoods, and so forth. And a reason I really like this example is once you've thought about it for a bit longer than I gave you, you'll come fairly firmly down onto the, the view that the majority actually had. Here's an argument for that. I'm about to pick a card. I could ask you, what's the probability that the other side is the same color as the side that I show you? And the answer is, well, two thirds of them have the same color and one third don't. So that's a sort of informal way without using Bayes' theorem saying, well, there must be a two thirds chance that it's the same color on the other side, right? And if you think about it, and if you work out Bayes' theorem, you'll find that two thirds was the right answer. And what I really love about this exercise is it's got nothing to do with the priors. 
Many people misunderstand Bayesian methods and say it's all about the priors. Oh, these subjective priors that where do people get from that? Oh, it's a load of rubbish. <laughs> The prior was, they're all equally likely. It wasn't about the prior. The reason it comes out two thirds, one third is because that's what probability tells you is the right answer. And I really don't know what's on the other side here. Okay, so it was actually, uh, it was white on the reverse, but you can play with your own cards as much as you want. Confirm this empirically, use Bayes' theorem. That's your first homework exercise. So homework one is to go ahead and do that. Good, I'm glad we did that because now we know how good people are at doing Bayes' theorem in their head. Another reason I love that example is it shows you even the very simplest problem with only two hypotheses. You know, it was either this card or this card. It's a science experiment with two possible theories and one data point, you are seeing red. It's the simplest problem you can imagine and people get it wrong. Nearly half of you still got it wrong. So it shows that we need Bayes' theorem because people, you know, you ask, a well-educated human, a problem like this, and many of them aren't quite sure. And even if you'd all got it right and said B, I still would have asked, you know, how sure are you, you know, and were you sure the first time? <laughs> and, and Bayes' theorem is great because it gives you the right answer. You just write down Bayes' theorem. It's your homework problem. It's easy. You'll get the right answer and you can rely on it. It's fantastic stuff. So this is a lecture about information theory. And so why did I mention Bayes' theorem? Well, actually, Bayesian inference Data modeling and information theory are just two sides of the same coin. And so I hope you'll be able to find lots of ways in which information theory is connected to your interests in machine learning. I am going to use very few slides because I sometimes enjoy writing on blackboards. There are lecture notes for the entire lecture. They are chapter one of the book, which is in the bookshop. The bookshop's over here. And <laughs> you can... You can get this also from the CUP bookshop, which is on King's Parade, uh, but you can get it discounted from the bookshop if you ask me today. And so chapter one is what I'm going to do today. Who has already read chapter one, just so I know how, how bored people are going to be? Okay, so that's about a quarter of you have already read chapter one. Sorry, it's for the rest, okay? That's the deal, all right? If, if you want to stand up and walk out right now, I won't be offended at all. So uh, do feel free to leave now. I'd prefer you to leave now than sit there doing your email. Um, so, I'm using the board, there are lecture notes, it's chapter one, it's free online, you can download the whole thing, um, don't download it now, download it a little bit later, um, <laughs> and um, keep it on your laptop, it's free, enjoy. Um, so, we're going to talk about information theory. Information theory was invented by Claude Shannon in 1948 to solve communication problems. That was the goal, Shannon, 1948. And Shannon was an amazing guy. He defined all the fundamental problems of the field and solved pretty much all of them, at least from a theoretical point of view. He raised all the theoretical questions and solved all of them all in one paper. The fundamental problem he addressed is the problem of reliable communication over an unreliable channel. Let me give you some examples of unreliable channels, and we don't need the uh, slides anymore. So examples of channels. One example is uh, the air between my throat and your ear. And so we've got a voice creating stuff, and it ends up making something happen in your ear. We could have telephone lines uh, connecting voices to ears as well, or we could have a copper wire uh, connecting some computers talking to each other. So we could have a couple of modems, one modem sending digital files to another modem. Or we might be thinking of uh, deep space, so vacuum, and you could pick your favorite spacecraft, maybe the Indian lunar orbiter, um, and it's trying to send signals to Earth that possibly missing. Um, and Galileo was another wonderful example, orbiting Jupiter. Okay, 
So here's a bunch of channels. Uh, here's one more. You could have a magnetic film, a magnetized film, and it's sitting inside a thing that we call a disk drive, an old fashioned disk drive using a spinning disk with magnetized film on board. And you want to somehow write a file onto the disk drive and then later on read it off and get your file back. This is also an example of a channel. Unlike these examples, the two ends of the channel are in exactly the same place. Uh, so my voice, your ear, they're in different places. Lots of channels go from A to B. The disk drive, you put the file on at one time, and then later on, in exactly the same place, you want to get the file back again. So the channel's going from you to you at a different time. OK, those are some examples of channels. And all real channels have the property that you put in a transmitted signal and then what comes out, the received signal, is not actually identical to the transmitted signal. It's different. And so you could think of it perhaps as being the transmission plus some noise. It might be related to the transmission in some way, transformed as well and typically noise has been added to it. For example, if we send photons through the vacuum, um, some of those photons end up being lost or absorbed or scattered uh, along the way. Uh, if you've got a piece of copper wire, there's thermal noise in your amplifiers that are connecting um, the, uh, the system together, and that thermal noise creates background hiss as, as well. So all of these channels uh, have noise. If you've got a disk drive, the magnetization that you induce with your head on your disk drive at one point may spontaneously change to a different magnetization because the, read, the writer didn't write very well. It didn't have a strong enough field. Um, or you know, th a thermal fluctuation got um, uh, the magnetization undone. Or maybe the magnetization is right, but the reader, the he reading head in your disk drive, reads the wrong magnetization because the head wasn't quite on the the center of the track. So that's another example of the output, the received signal, not being the same as the transmitted signal. OK. So what we would like is reliable com communication. We'd really like to have a channel where what comes out is what was transmitted, because that's almost always what we're, we're really wanting to pay for. We'd like received signal to equal transmitted. So what are some solutions for this problem? Well, solutions can be divided into two classes. We can have physical solutions and system solutions. Examples of physical solutions are if you've got a lousy disk drive, you could put it in the bin and make a better one. For example, use thicker copper wires, cool the disk drive down to low temperatures to get rid of thermal noise, um, maybe uh, use bigger magnets, um, use a thicker film, I, I don't know. It, you can imagine physical solutions. You throw money at the problem and pick a currency and throw the and throw the old solution away. It's exciting. Modify channels. Make new channels so that are less noisy. Use more power. Use more money. That's not what information theory is about. Information theory is about the audacious attitude of saying, let's add systems to our lousy channel. So we'll accept a channel, no matter how lousy it is, and we're going to add encoding and decoding systems. So here's the channel in the middle. And having a problem with my hardware here. And here's the source message. Ah, oh, still problems. OK. New chalk. What's the solution for the chalk? New channel. <laughs> yeah. Well, you haven't learned information theory yet. <laughs> so. Otherwise, I could have just scratched the board and uh, everything would have been fine. Okay, let's. Aha! 
Okay, that was very expensive, but good in the circumstances. We've got our source message here, and what's going to come out of the right-hand side, let's give it a name, let's call it S for source. Oh, crikey. Okay. Stay. We'll give it a name, S, and we'll have S hat coming out of the right-hand side here. If we shoved it straight into the channel, of course, this wouldn't work. So we're going to have a thing called an encoder here, which is a system that does something. And out of it comes the coded transmission, let's call it. So our transmission is something that depends somehow on the source message. We'll call that T for transmission. The channel is perhaps adding some noise that we might call N. And then what's coming out of the channel is the received, corrupted, noisy message R. Then we're going to have another system here. And this is called the decoder, the decoding system. And that is going to do what? Well, let's be clear about what the encoder is doing. For this whole game to work, we need the encoding system to add redundancy. This is an informal thing I'm saying here. Add redundancy to the transmission. That redundancy, which the decoder will know about, it will know the system that's being used to add the redundancy. That redundancy is then going to help the decoder to infer both the source signal and the noise. Which is pretty cool, hey? That's the plan. It's going to exploit the known redundancy adding system to do that inference. And I say infer in the sense of, well, we may want to use Bayes' theorem when the time comes to do some decoding. OK. So let's have an example. To discuss this more, how encoders and decoders work, let's give ourselves an example channel. Do you need more light on this board over here? Yeah. So the model channel we're going to discuss for the rest of today, and I emphasize this is just a model and information theory covers lots and lots of channels, but this is the favorite model, simple channel, is called the binary symmetric channel. And it works like this. It's got an input and it's got an output. And every time cycle, every clock tick, you get to put one input in and immediately an output comes out of it. And the input you can put in is a binary variable. It's either 0 or 1. And the output that comes out will be a 0 or a 1. And you're hoping that 0 will go to 0 and 1 will go to 1. But sometimes you're unlucky and you get what we call a flip. The bit gets flipped. The input I'll call x generally and the output y, and we'll put a probability 1 minus f on these two arrows, and a probability f on this arrow, and a probability f on this arrow. This little diagram here is a shorthand for a set of four statements of the form. The probability that y equals 1, given that x equals 0, is f. That's the meaning of this arrow here with an f on it. So this isn't a graphical model. Uh, this would be a graphical model. <laughs> um, this is a diagram showing you the probabilities, all right? OK, so there's four such statements, and the one I've written down is the one for this arrow here. Right. OK, you could think of this as a model for a disk drive. Let's imagine that with your certificate of um, engineering competence in your pocket, you decide, let's go and make a startup company selling disk drives. And you say, we've got a wonderful new nano, super low temperature way of making disk drives. And we've made our first prototype, and here it is. And the only problem is it flips 10% of the bits that you store on the drive. OK, so here's a question for you. Imagine that this model is an accurate model of the new disk drive that you've, you've made. You've got this disk drive. Unfortunately, it flips 10% of the bits. And imagine that you sell it anyway. You, know, you get your snake oil sales people to help you with the pitch to the VCs and so forth, and you start producing these. Um, and you sell one to your first customer. And the first customer tries to store a 10,000-bit file 
uh, on this disk drive and then read it off again. Um, how many bits will be flipped is the, the first question. So if you store 10,000 bits and read them off again, roughly how many bits are going to be flipped? I want a rough answer complete with error bars, please. Have a chat to your neighbor. Okay, roughly how many bits are flipped? Anyone? Anyone? No one? A thousand plus or minus? A thousand plus or minus 30. Any other answer apart from a thousand plus or minus 30? Plus or minus 60. Okay. Why are you saying 60? Two standard deviations. Why are you saying 30? Fine. Okay. <laughs> Fine. It's just conventions, right? Grant. Excellent. So you all know the binomial distribution. And one of the really wonderful things about information theory is you only need to know the binomial distribution to do pretty much the whole topic. So uh, question uh, 1A, will your user be happy with that number of bits being flipped in their file? <laughs> I imagine not. OK. Well. How many bits might they be happy with in a typical file? Zero. Zero. Yeah? OK. So now let's imagine that by making either a new physical channel or by adding encoding and decoding systems, we manage to create a new channel that is a binary symmetric channel with a much lower flip probability f. How small does it need to be if we're going to get what Ian wants, which is zero errors? So here's question two. To make a successful business selling one gigabyte disk drives, how small do you actually want the flip probability to be of a binary symmetric channel? Have a chat to your neighbor. May I? Yeah, I think that's it. You're not chatting to each other. Are you done? Do you have an answer? What's F? What's F? What's F? Say again. We'd like zero. I want a, another answer, not zero. Talk to each other. Yeah? Thank <laughs> you. 
talk to each other. Talk. Okay, let's get some answers. Some people are saying f is zero, but that's not how small it needs to be. That would be grand, f is zero would be grand, but how small does it need to be? So, shout out some answers. Depends on what you want. Depends on what you want, good. So you, you had to invent what you wanted. What do you want? Uh, uh, one, one bit error and one gigabyte bit. Okay, and then f is what? And then I think computer, so. <laughs> I gave you enough time. Okay, someone else. Uh, 10 to the minus 9. 10 to the minus 9. No, no less than that. No, eight. Eight. One over 10 to the minus 10. No. 10 to the minus 10. That's a lot less than 10 to the minus 9. It, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? It also depends on what probability of error you want. Okay. <laughs> I'm asking you how small you want it to be. I'm asking you a real world question. You're about to start a business. What are you going to do? But what's the target? Do, do, do you tell the engineers, look, just keep on spending money making it smaller and smaller and they've got down to 10 to the minus 100 and, they, and you say, no, get it smaller than 10 to the minus 100. Or is that unreasonable? Do we need it better than 10 to the minus 100? 10 to the minus 12. 10 to the minus 12? <laughs> Any advance on 10 to the minus 12? <laughs> Again? Okay. I'm asking once we've made the whole system, how good do we want the whole system to be? I'm not allowing you to. Um, we're going to sell it as it is without extra encoders and decoders. So. N square P square multiplying by one minus P. Okay. So if you have N square, is 10 to minus. Yeah, 9. Okay, someone else who's got a, num <laughs> a, a, a number. Oh, so you're going to give up and just say, take the best that's available. <laughs> I'm asking you what you, know, what, what you, what you need. Okay, this is a calculation we can do. We, we already had an answer of a way of posing the question. You want one flip in an entire gigabyte. I don't think that's actually good enough, because if someone's got a huge operating system and they load it in off the disk drive every single day, then you want to read successfully the whole operating system, which might be a gigabyte, every single day. Every day of using it for five years. You have more than one customer. And you've got more than one customer. How many customers is your successful company going to have? A million? Yeah. So, I think we need something like one gigabyte every day times 365 days in the year, times the number of years that we're going to go for, five years, times the number of customers, because we don't want to get a reputation based on just a few unlucky customers for get, making lousy disk drives. So if we want none of the customers to be unhappy, how many customers do we want? A million? That's the number of bits that must be successfully transmitted. And so we want the error probability to be smaller than one over that number. And if it's a little bit smaller, maybe 10 times smaller than that, we're going to be fine. And we don't need to ask for 10 to the minus 100, which would be much smaller than this. This will be good enough. We don't need to multiply the number of customers because we have that many disks, so then we need to multiply the number. Okay, uh, let's, so let's take this factor and we can put it in and take it out and see what difference it makes and have a conversation about whether we need this or not. So. Um, What's this lot? A gigabyte is 10 to the 9 times 8, which is about 10 to the 10. And that is about 10 to the 3. OK? So we're either talking about 1 over 10 to the 13 if we just say 1 bit failure in the lifetime of one disk is acceptable for any disk drive, or we're talking about 1 over 10 to the 19 if we want to satisfy a million customers at that same level. This is giving us one error in the entire set of all disk drives that we sell. And you're saying, no, that's too stringent. 1 in 10 to the 19 is too demanding. We don't quite need that. Would this be OK? Well, that would mean that within a year or so of people using your disk drives, 
uh, they, they would be unhappy customers. Now, of course, you could just blame it on Microsoft and say, no, it was the operating system that caused the problem. <laughs> and they'll probably believe you. So maybe this is all right. <laughs> but it's got to be somewhere in this range, right? OK. So this is an important sort of reasoning to be able to do in real life. Whatever you do, you've got to be able to do back of envelope calculations. If you haven't learned to do them, and I can give you another uh, three to do before breakfast tomorrow. Um, what are we he heading towards? Here's a sort of median figure, which is stronger than any of the suggestions you made, um, but I think that's a sensible sort of figure. It's somewhere in between those. The industry standard is 1 in 10 to the 18. If you want to sell a disk drive to Dell to put in their computer, you must have proof somehow that your disk drives deliver that performance. One bit wrong in 10 to the 18. So this is actually the standard. And this is what I'm going to assume we're aiming for today. Okay? And now we're going to discuss how to take the lousy disk drive that's actually flipping 10% of bits, add encoding and decoding systems to deliver this sort of performance. 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 15. Okay. So what we want to do is come up with some ideas about what this encoder and decoder are going to be. So to start off with, does anyone have any suggestions of an example of an encoder, a way of adding redundancy in a way that we think might be useful? An example way of adding redundancy. Duplicate. Duplicate. Repeat. So if the source file has got a one in it, we duplicate some number of times. How many? OK. So, so every one gets turned into three ones, say, and every zero gets turned into three zeros. Is that the sort of thing you had in mind? OK. But possibly you need more. Let's start with the simple one. I'm going to call this code R3 for repeat three times. So when I say repeat three times, the total number of times the bit gets sent is three times. All right? It's not four times. That would be another convention for what we mean by rep repetition. So this is the source, and this is the transmitted. And we read the source one bit at a time, and we use this encoding rule. So for example, if the source, if the entire source file were 011101, then we would transmit 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. OK. Now, for the binary symmetric channel, we can describe the noise that mucks things up as being a binary string as well, a list of zeros and ones, with zeros showing the bits that luckily didn't get flipped, and ones showing bits that did get flipped. So here's a noise vector that might occur. All right. That means that the received vector would be now we add modulo 2 along here, 0, 0, 0. 1 and 1 is 0. 1 and 0 is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. OK, that's an example of going this far. We've encoded, and we've gone through the channel, and we've got a received signal. And now we need to invent an appropriate decoder for the right-hand side. And here's a slide showing what we've done so far. Um, I've actually reordered the bits, so you can see the three repetitions spread out in, in time. But conceptually, it's just the same thing. OK. A way of implementing this would be to buy, to sell, sorry, when you're selling your disk drives, actually sell three of them inside the box. OK? And every time you store a file, you put the bit on disk drive one, two, and three, and you tell them there's one disk drive in here, OK? <laughs> All right, we need a decoder. So where does that go? It goes here. What's the decoder going to do? What, what is the right decoder? Have a chat to your neighbor.
Okay. What's the decoder? There's various ways of saying the answer, yeah. Okay, so the suggested decoder is read out the number in the middle and ignore the rest, okay? So this would take 111 and give you 1, it would take 110 and give you 1, it would take 101, give you 0, and 000, and it would give you 0, yeah? Okay. Uh, other suggestions of decoders? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so majority vote. Decoder, which is the most common. So we say one here, one here, one here. Ooh, disagrees. And go down the list, and we get zero there. Everyone understand what we mean by majority vote? Okay. Um, you were suggesting a different decoder. What, what do you think of the choice between these? Um, yeah, I just choose to decode it because of the example. Ah, very good. Yeah, I think it's a really good way to learn is by examples, but some sort of, <laughs> some form of overfitting may have, may have happened here. <laughs> good. Um, what's another way of motivating a decoder? You said, ah, majority vote decoder, and you came up with this idea. How, how could you have derived the decoder? What does the decoder? Estimation. Most likely... Okay. <coughs> Estimation, or I'd say inference. It's inference is what we're doing. We want to say how probable is it that the uh, source signal was, say... Um, Hmm, example. Let's take the 011 there. So given that you've got a received signal like 011, how probable is it that it was a zero? And we use Bayes' theorem, because that's the right way to do inference. It works for the, the red cards. It works for any well-defined inference problem. So we can use Bayes' theorem and write down, well, it's the probability of getting 011 given S is zero, times the probability that S is zero, Normalized by dividing by the other explanation and this one. So here's the first term upstairs. Then the other term that could have been upstairs is everything with S replaced. Um, S is 0 replaced by S is 1. P of R is 0, 1, 1. Given S equals 1, P of S equals 1. And now we need to sweat about what's the prior going to be? Oh, no. <laughs> It's so subjective. Oh dear. Well, I'm going to set the prior to 50 50. So this is a half here for the prior. And the business end of this, what it's all about in this problem is the likelihood function. And so we want to know what's this? How probable is it that we would get the data that we did get if s was 0, which appears twice here? And how probable would it be under the other hypothesis? And that's what this is all about. And the answer to that is, well, the probability of getting 0, 1, 1 when you send s equals 0 is the first bit would have to be not flipped. So this is equal to 1 minus f times, because there's a probability 1 minus f that it doesn't, doesn't get flipped, times f, because the second bit would have had to be flipped, times f, because the third had to be flipped. That is the likelihood function. It's 1 minus f to the power of the number of bits that didn't need to be flipped, times f to the power of the number that did need to be flipped. And this one here comes to... We need to flip the first one, in order for this outcome to happen, and um, 1 minus f squared, we have to not flip the other two. So that's the two likelihoods. And when you then do the trivial algebra to finish off this calculation, you find that the answer comes out to f. OK, so I've skipped over the trivial algebra. And the answer is there's a 10% chance that this was a 0. And there's a 90% chance that it's a 1. So that's your decoder. It's your majority vote decoder, but it's quantified, and it tells you how probable it is. Bayes' theorem's wonderful. I commend it to you. Okay. So 
What's the big picture of what was going on here? We're looking at alternative explanations and we're counting how many bits would have to be flipped. And then the most probable explanation is the, the one that required the smallest number of flips. So that's the general description of the majority vote decoder. It says, find the hypothesis that involves the smallest number of flips. So here's another way of saying it. Find the hypothesis about S that involves fewest flips. And that will be the maximum likelihood estimator for S. Also, the most probable estimate for S if the prior is 50-50. Good. And you can do that. And here's what it looks like when you apply that to this particular file and this particular outcome. And you can probably see that what came out is still not the same as what went in because this decoder is still making errors. OK, so the suggestion is let's imagine changing the number of repetitions. Now, if we had two repetitions only, we would get nothing. Well, would we get nothing? Have a chat to your neighbor. What do you think? Do people think R2 is really useless? What's the decoder going to do for these four cases here? Presumably we go with the majority vote idea here. And then what do we do here? Use the prior, which was 50-50. So we get a question mark out that just says it's 50-50. Is this completely useless? Well, it's a different channel from what we started with. We've packed two disk drives in the box, and now we've got a disk drive whose output is either zero question mark or one. So it's a different channel. And how useful it is may be different from what we started with. What we need to do to answer this question, is this any good, and is R3 any good, is we need to work out now how good this overall system is. And one way of quantifying that is to say, what's the probability that what comes out will actually be different from what went in? All right, and so let's do that for R3, and then we can think about other values of n in Rn, where we repeat n, n times. So let's work out the probability that S is not equal to S hat. Talk to your neighbor, work it out. Okay, 
So the question is, we send one bit over the channel, S, and it gets encoded into three, received, decoded by the majority vote decoder, and we get a single bit out. What's the probability that that bit isn't the same as that bit? Any answers? Yeah. OK, just yawning. Someone else. Yeah. F cubed. OK, any advance on F cubed? More. OK, great. And uh, anyone else have that answer? All right. Wow, OK, so two of you are doing really well. And the rest we've lost because I went too fast. OK, do you want to explain where this came from? Yeah, it, it, it is uh, either we, we have two, uh, two Philippines uh, or three, three Philippines. Uh, so the, the first one is the Philips, and the other one is the Philippines or two Philips. OK. Good. So the explanation is, if S hat is not equal to S, then something bad happened on the channel. Definitely there weren't zero flips for this particular episode, uh, because everything would have been fine. One flip can be corrected. I didn't actually step you through that, but hopefully that was obvious, that the majority vote decoder can correct any one flip in a block of three. But if there's two flips, we're in trouble. The majority vote decoder will get it wrong. And if there's three, we're in trouble, and we'll get it wrong. So we want to know the probability that there exist two flips or three flips. And you can solve that problem without using Bayes' theorem, because this is just an exercise in forward probability. All right? You just need to know the binomial distribution that tells you the probability distribution of the number of flips. And the probability of two flips is binomial thingy. And this is three choose one, if you like, binomial coefficient. And this is the probability of three flips. OK. Sorry, yeah. Can I ask about, the, about one, like one mass, why is the length of S is three? The length of S can be okay. larger than three. OK. Uh, what I made clear verbally, but didn't write on the board, is that here I'm talking about a single bit being sent over the channel, just one bit, and turned into three transmitted bits, then decoded. And for that single episode, just sending one bit, what's the probability that those two particular bits are equal to each other? Sorry I didn't write that down clearly. All right. So. Now, who could explain this to someone else in Churchill who didn't come today? All right. OK, so we've got half of you on board. So we're doing all right. Those of you who didn't just put up your hand, please let me know right now what's the, what's the issue here? What's not clear in this expression? Why, if, you, if you understand what you don't understand, then help me understand. <laughs> no? OK, who understands this? <laughs> that, that helps. <laughs> Great. OK, and how does this roughly scale? Well, if f is small, like 0.1, or maybe even smaller than 0.1, we care about the biggest term in this series. And the biggest term is the one with the smallest power of, uh, of f in it. So this is roughly 3f squared. OK. So. What we can do is draw a diagram showing where we've got to so far. And this diagram is going to summarize the good news and the bad news. The good news is we've got an error probability that's roughly 3f squared. Brilliant. That's smaller. It's smaller than f. It's something like 0.03, for example, if we started with an f of 0.1. So that's good news. We have made a system, an encoding and decoding system, with an error probability, which I'll draw up here, that is smaller than what we started with. We started with an error probability of f, for example, 0.1. And now we've got a probability of roughly 3f squared, which, for example, when f is 0.1, is about 0.03. So we've reduced it. Brilliant. We wanted to get down to 10 to the minus 15, and we're going to get there. So we're not quite there yet. But what's the bad news? The good news was we've dropped this. The bad news is every time we sell one disk drive to someone, actually inside the box there's three disk drives. <laughs> or if we're using a telephone line and we use R3 to send our file over the lousy modem that flips 10% of the bits, we have to make a phone call that lasts three times as long. Or we have to buy three telephone lines that are lousy. Okay? 
And the way we quantify this is we use a thing called the rate of communication. The rate was one by definition when we started with the channel with no error correction and we had a flip probability of f. And what we've done is we've improved the error probability, but the rate has got lower. We define the rate to be the ratio of the number of source bits that are actually being sent to the number of times we use the channel. And so for R3, which I rubbed off, R3 has the property that S involved the number of source bits, which we call K, which was one, and T had a number of transmitted bits, which we call N, which was three, and the rate Oops. The rate is k over n is one third. So that's the bad news. But it's promising, isn't it? I'll leave as a homework exercise to discuss whether R2 is a good idea or not. This was R1, which means no code. And here's another homework exercise for you. What happens when we switch to Rn, where n is an odd number like 5 or 7 or 13 or 51? And in particular, how big does n need to be? Homework. Think about Rn. How big does n need to be to deliver Pb, which is my name for the probability of bit error, probability of bit error to deliver the PB that I said we wanted, which is 10 to the minus 15 for today's lecture. How big does N need to be? Do you understand the question? Okay, so that's a homework problem. And when you've done your homework problem, you will find that the answer for F is 0.1 is 61. So here's the answer at the back of the book. Answer, assuming f is 0.1, n is 61. OK. And this is a graph showing exactly the numbers we've just been talking about. R1, R3, brrr, down to R61. And this is saying, yes, we can make encoding and decoding systems that have the property that we can get the error probability down to the required level. So this is possible. We just need to put 61 disk drives inside the box, and we say, here's your disk drive. <laughs> Oops, OK, there's one disk drive in there. And it costs us 61 times as much to make as we'd really like. OK, now, can we do better? Here's the astonishing, amazing thing. The amazing thing is, we can do much better than repetition codes. And so anyone want to suggest other ways of adding redundancy apart from repetition? Say again? What does sphere packing mean? Okay. OK. OK, so make a lattice of points in a high-dimensional space, is the idea. Make a lattice of points in a high-dimensional space. And you want that lattice of points. These are going to be transmissions. So there's going to be a great long list of transmissions, like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, could be a possible transmission of some length n. And then you could also have 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And maybe you've got 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK. And you could have some systematic way of making these points, such that there's a big gap between all of them. All right? And then you take source files. And let's say, if for simplicity you just had this as your set of lattice points, you could say, ah, oh, the possible source files I'm going to work with are going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This is an example of a block 
code. The idea is we're going to take a block of source bits at a time. Instead of taking them one at a time and repeating them, we're going to take them two at a time, and then every pair is going to get encoded in a more complicated way than simple repetition, like that. Okay? This is an example of a lattice of points in a, an eight-dimensional space. There's four of them, and we can associate them with source strings. That's called a block code. And for it to work well, we want these to be a long way from each other because we don't want flips to confuse them with each other. All right? So that's a, a high-level statement of if you make a block code, that's what we want. Some vectors over here that are very different from each other. OK, now we want a more concrete prescription of how do we make a block code. We don't have to do block codes, but let's talk about block codes now. Anyone got a suggestion of a way of making a block code, a, an, an explicit principle of how a block code could work? Anyone? Parity checks. Parity checks. Great. Who's heard of parity checks? OK, so what's a parity check? OK, so we take a source block, and then after the source block, we, we first transmit the source bits in the clear. And then after we've transmitted them, we send an extra bit, or well, possibly more than one extra bit, but you said one extra bit that is a sum of bits. So you can have some source bits, and you take a block of them, and you transmit them, and you also transmit their sum. So here's some possible things that you could have, 110, 101, and we could add an extra bit that is the sum of these, modulo 2. 1 and 1 and 1 is 1, 1, 1, 0 is 0, it's an even number of 1s, 101, okay, 0, all the way down to 0, 0, 0, OK, and this is a way of getting from k is 3 bits to n is 4. Right, this is another example of a block code. It happens to have eight possible inputs here, so we've got three bits mapping to four bits. This would have a rate of three quarters. OK, we've got going. We've got the idea of we want to make long things, and we want them to be different from each other, and maybe we can use parity checks. I'm not going to tell you one of the first block codes that was invented. It was invented by a guy called Hamming, and it's called the 7-4 Hamming code. And it works like this. It's going to map four bits to... seven bits, and it's going to work by sending the first, sending the four bits in the clear, and then appending another three parity bits that are made in this sort of way. I'm going to show you exactly how now. So we write the four source bits in here, S1, S2, S3, S4. Then we call this T5, this T6, and this T7. And these are the parity bits, which we append afterwards. And those parity bits are going to be set in such a way that the number of ones in each circle is an even number. Let me give you an example. So let's imagine that S is 1, 0, 0, 0. That's going to get turned into a t of length 7. And we do it by writing s into the circle. Here we go, 1, 0, 0, 0. And now we set the others, t5, t6, and t7, such that the number of ones in this circle is even. That means we need a 1 there. And then this needs a 0. And then here, we need a 1. OK, that was the encoder. Here's a few more examples. Please talk to your neighbor and fill in the encodings for those. And we'll have a, a three-minute 
break for you to chat about everything that's been going on. Any questions? So, let's just check that we all agree on this. So you transmit 0111 and you write 010. Yeah, 1110 and the parity bits are 100. And there's a list of obviously 16 possibilities in here. I'm just giving you four of them. And this final one is 1111111. And one way we could have got this is all of these particular encoding operations we're doing here are linear. They involve modulo 2 addition, which is a linear operation. And we could have noticed 1000 and 0111. You add them and you get 111. So we can add this to this and get this. So these two code words added gives you that code word. So this is an example of what's called a linear block code. We don't have to do that, it's just an example of one. Right, okay, so we send this transmission over a channel and something happens. Let's send the 100 for example and let's pretend we didn't know that that was what was sent. So we'll note down that actually we transmitted 100, 101, but we'll keep that information secret from ourselves from now on, and we'll say, let's imagine that what we receive is, let's, should we flip one bit without telling ourselves? Let's imagine we receive 11001101. Okay. And we don't know what was transmitted. And now what do we do with this? We need to invent a decoder. What's the general decoding algorithm? Well, we could write down Bayes' theorem, enumerate all the hypotheses, there's 16 of them, and we can evaluate how probable they are. And we know that the most probable hypothesis will be the transmission hypothesis that involves the smallest number of flips. So that's two ways of saying what we want to do. Look at all 16 hypotheses, find the most probable one, or the one that involves the smallest number of flips. That's the correct universal answer to the problem, and it has an awful complexity. It scales as 2 to the k, which is 2 to the 4, which is 16. So we have to look at all 16 hypotheses. Um, but there's actually a sneaky way of getting there more efficiently. We can find the most probable answer by taking the same little diagram and writing received 1, received 2, received 3, received 4, received 5, received 6, and received 7 into this diagram, and then seeing which circles are happy and which are sad. <laughs> so here we go. We write in 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. And just to remind you, there's a little secret that that's the one we actually flipped, all right? But we don't know that anymore. And now we bring out our green and red pens and we say which circles are happy. Remember the rule is the number of ones in a circle has to be even. And circle number one says, no, 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 I'm unhappy, which is red. Circle number two says, I'm unhappy. And then circle number three says, no, 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 that's two, I'm happy. What we're doing here is computing a thing called the syndrome. It's like talking to the doctor about the things you're feeling at the moment, which aren't a description of the actual thing that's wrong with you. They're the signs of the underlying problem, which was maybe some of these bits got flipped. We're certain that at least one of them got flipped because all the circles should have been happy if no flips had occurred. So definitely something bad happened. Who was the, the troublesome guy? Well, the decoding rule, the decoder says, find a single bit that lies inside all unhappy circles and outside all happy circles. And that is this one, because it's inside all the red and it's outside all the green. And then you say, unflip that one. Unflip the one bit that has that property. So we do that and we get one zero, 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 one, zero, one. So we've unflipped this and we've solved the problem. In this case, we've got the right answer. And a wonderful homework problem for you to enjoy is to confirm that if you flip any single bit, 
whether it's one of the source bits in the middle or one of the parity bits, this decoder can detect and correct. This decoder can detect the error and correct it. Cool. I think that's exciting. So, what's the probability of error for this 7.4 Hamming code? Well, it's going to be in trouble, in fact, as you can confirm, if more than one bit gets flipped. Because then the decoder is going to detect and correct a single error, and you'll end up with three. So, failures still occur. You end up with S, some bit S, not equaling what it was meant to be. This happens if there exists more, two or more errors. So, you end up with some errors occurring, and another homework problem for you is to work out exactly what the probability is of a particular bit not equaling what it ought to equal. And what you'll find, as before with the repetition code, is since it messes up when there's two or more errors, this is going to end up scaling as f squared, and the constant out front is something like 9. So, that's the probability of bit error. And this is very exciting. Why is it exciting? Well, it's exciting because it's scaling as f squared, which is the same scaling that R3 had, but we've got it at a much bigger rate. So we've got a rate of 4 sevenths, and the error probability is in the ballpark of f squared. It happens to be 9 f squared, a, bit, a, little, bit, a little bit bigger, three times bigger. Um, so it's not completely convincing that we've really made any progress, but the fact is we have. By expanding our worldview beyond plain old repetition as a way of adding redundancy, we've got the error probability into places it couldn't get to before. So the next slide is going to show you where you can get to by inventing more block codes. And I'm now going to tell you your main homework problem for tonight. Your main homework problem is to invent another block code and a decoder for it and add it to this diagram. OK? Invent a code. And a decoder, work out what its R is, and work out what its PB is, its probability bit error. Work that out and add it to the diagram. So that's a fun homework problem for you. And these pluses show where people have got to with a whole bunch of codes you can find in textbooks on coding theory that were written in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you can see a whole load of those pluses are to the right of where you can get to with repetition codes. Remember, where we want to be is low error probability and large as possible rate. So this arrow is showing where we want to get to. We like being in this bottom right-hand corner. We'd love to have a code with a huge rate like 1 and an error probability of 0 which on a log scale is way down here. We love this. We don't like that. So, OK, this is a linear scale. This is a log scale. They're identical graphs, um, but just on the right one's log scale. OK, so that's your homework problem. And the obvious question that this diagram is now raising is, ooh, isn't this exciting? We can do better than repetition codes. Well, how good can it get? Where can we get to? by being cleverer. Where can we get to by generalizing the 7-4 Hamming code and coming up with other ideas? And you can see just a vague sort of scatter of points and no clear indication of where we can get to. But you might imagine that the answer to this question, where is the boundary? What's achievable? Where's the boundary between achievable and non-achievable points? You might imagine that the answer to that question is, well, surely it's a line of some sort that goes through the origin. So maybe, with a question mark, maybe the boundary looks something like this. Because that's what Sod's law would say. It would say, you can't get something for nothing 
if you want the error probability to get lower and lower and lower, you will be forced by this boundary to have a rate that gets lower and lower as well. That certainly is consistent with what happens with the repetition codes. If you want to get the error probability down to 10 to the minus 15, the rate had to go way down here. If you wanted to get 10 to the minus 50, the rate would have to get e even lower. So you'd be pushed towards zero. That's Sod's law. That's the way normal life is. You, you want something really, really good, you have to pay for it. And here, the units you pay in would be rate. And before Shannon came along, I'm sure everyone in the field of communication imagined this was the case, that the boundary between achievable and not achievable points was some sort of line going through the origin. And here is the most exciting result of the 20th century. The most exciting result is that the boundary between achievable and non-achievable points does not go through the origin. It comes down here, like that, and meets this axis at a non-zero value, which is a property of the channel that we're working with. It's a property called the capacity of the channel. This is saying that it's possible to get the error probability as small as you like. You can get it down to 10 to the minus 15, or 10 to the minus 18, or 10 to the minus 50, or as small as you want, all at big rates. And for this particular channel that we've been discussing today, which board should I move on to now? I've lost track. Let's use this one. For this binary symmetric channel, the capacity is about a half. actually a tiny bit bigger than a half. And here's the formula for it, expressed in terms of the binary entropy function. What does this mean? This means a stunning fact. It means that if you have got a totally lousy disk drive that's flipping 10% of the bits, there exists an encoding and decoding system you can wrap around this disk drive such that if you just hide two disk drives in the box, two meaning that you'd be working at a rate of one half, here, which is below capacity, you can get the error probability down to 10 to the minus 18. No problem. And you can get it down to 10 to the minus 50, 10 to the minus 100. It's possible. And all you need is two disk drives in the box. So isn't it one more thing, which is the complexity of the encoder and decoder? Is it OK. So that's a topic for another lecture. So the question is, what's the complexity? What I'm telling you is that the theorem says there exists an encoder and a decoder that you can slap around your channel and you can achieve any point on this diagram. The theorem just says it exists. And it's a very cheeky theorem because the proof is non-constructive. It just says it exists and it doesn't tell you anything about the complexity. And if you take it literally the way that you'd imagine implementing something along the lines of what Shannon describes in his theorem, the complexity would probably scale exponentially for the sort of thing he was describing. But in my next lecture, I'm going to tell you in practice how to make codes that do indeed get virtually as close as you like to capacity. It's a solved problem, and the complexity required scales just as k log k, where k is the size of the block of data that you encode. So k log k is almost the same as k, which is the cost of sending thing in the first place. So there exist codes that have uh, a, an encoding and decoding complexity, definitely within k cubed, less than k cubed. There's lots of codes that achieve this. But this is a revolution in the last decade um, that this has actually um, happened. Up until 1993, uh, no one knew how to actually make codes that achieve this. So, this was the most exciting result of the 20th century, along with the uh, other result, which was how to actually achieve it, which Shannon didn't, didn't provide. Yeah? What if you write a file? Why, why, when you write a file of five bytes, it shows that it builds five bytes on your hard disk? OK, so the question is, when I use my hard drive and I store a five-byte file, it tells me that it's a five-byte file. Why? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. 
Okay, I think on my drive, if I store five bytes, it tells me I'm using about four kilobytes or something. Uh, uh, but your, your disk drive is lying to you about how much <laughs> disk space is being used. It, your CD is also lying to you. So, so this is a one megabyte floppy. This is a, what is it, half a gigabyte. Actually, the number of zeros and ones on this thing is about 50% bigger than they tell you. And the number of zeros and ones on this is going to be bigger as well. Because it has got an encoding and a decoding system in the floppy drive reader. And your CD reader, it's got three levels of encoder and decoder on the CD standard. So it's got a whole load of extra zeros and ones that are doing this sort of stuff. It's using one of these points on this diagram, which doesn't actually get you to the Shannon limit, so they were invented in the 60s, and they're still using this old technology from the 60s. And there's this nice, exciting big gap, and this gap was traversed in the uh, late 1990s. Any other questions? Yeah. Blu-ray using some accessories. What does Blu-ray use? I don't know. You'll have to Google. Uh, I'm sure Wikipedia knows what's on it. My guess would be it's still using the same sort of codes that they used on, on the CD. That's the way the dinosaurs moved. <laughs> Any other questions? And what's currently well, what's currently implemented that used the, the, the breakthrough technology? Okay, so the question is what systems are using codes that get very close to capacity? The answer is there's a standard called DVBS2, which is a dig digital something or other versatile broadcasting standard for satellites. DVBS2 uses codes which are called sparse graph codes. And the last four chapters of the blue book in the bookshop um, describe sparse graph codes. And in the next lecture, one of the things I plan to tell you about is a little bit about sparse graph codes to indicate how those work. Here's another application of these state-of-the-art sparse graph codes. In the latest mobile phone standards, I think it's a 3G standard, there are codes which are for an erasure channel. The channels I've been discussing so far are flipping bits, but there's another class of channel, which is one where you lose the entire block. You try and send a block, and then a whole load of question marks come out. That's called an erasure channel. You get question marks out. You know that you've lost a packet. Um, that's a good characterization of many, many channels nowadays. And the, uh, the 3G standard uses a, a particular erasure correcting code called a, a raptor code. A raptor code which was invented very recently. It's a class of fountain code and fountain codes are in chapter 50 of the blue book. <coughs> if you're not interested in coding theory, you still might be interested in the blue book because it's got lots of chapters on Monte Carlo methods and on variational methods as well. Um, let me indicate where I'm planning to go, and you can let me know if you think this is a, a good idea or not. So my plan for the next lecture is to tell you some more about another very important bit of information theory, namely data compression. Here we've been assuming we've got a file, and you want to send it over a channel, and we might encode it to protect against errors and then have a decoder. Real-life files often have a lot of redundancy in them already. And so here we're adding redundancy to protect against the noise. But it might be a good idea before we send the file to add in an extra compressor here, which gets rid of the trivial redundancies of our file that was written in English or whatever, and then an uncompressor here. These inner boxes here are called error correcting codes, coding theory, noisy channel coding. These outer boxes here are called source coding. Also, artificial intelligence is another name for it. Uh, they do source coding, they do data compression. And so the plan is to tell you some of the key ideas about data compression, which is the green boxes that we put around the white boxes, and then come back to noisy channel coding, tell you a little bit more about this amazing theorem that I just told you, and a little bit more about state-of-the-art error correcting codes. But I'm happy to talk about anything you want. I can talk on uh, any topic in this book and many others. So do let me know what you'd like to hear about. There was another question somewhere. Yeah. Just a quick one. That was the, what's the wider applicability of the codes for binary symmetric channels? Is that well represented in this drive, but maybe it doesn't apply elsewhere? OK, so the question is, 
Today we've looked at a toy channel called the binary symmetric channel, which is very simple, just zeros and ones in, and it's symmetric, so the probability of a flip one way is the same as the probability of a flip the other way. What about the real world? Is it a good model of real world channels? And the answer is it depends on the channel. You can look in the chapter in the blue book called Real Error Correcting Codes and Real Channels, and I give a summary there of examples of channels where uh, toy um, these sort of toy models are applicable. Deep space communications, for example, satellite communications. The binary symmetric channel is not a perfect model, but what is a good model is a very similar model, namely the Gaussian channel, where you send plus x or minus x, and then what comes out is a quantity that we could call y, and it's distributed like this or like that, all right? This is almost the same as the binary symmetric channel. Any particular output that pops out of this, like this, you've got a likelihood ratio between, well, it could have come from the minus x or it could have come from the plus x. So it's like a binary symmetric channel where the flip probability changes in a known way at every clock cycle. So it's almost the binary symmetric channel. This is called the AWGN, the Additive White Gaussian Noise Channel, and it's very, very, very widely used for satellite communications and deep space. For disk drives, um, neighboring bits interfere with each other. So for a disk drive, the binary symmetric channel is a lousy model. What they do instead is they make a model that includes these, the inferences between neighboring bits stored on the platter. So you end up with this rule that it's a really bad idea to try and store 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 because um, those bits are liable to flip each other. And so you end up with 1, 1, 1 in a row, for example, because the magnetizations like to agree with each other. Um, so you need a different channel model to actually play disk drives. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, are there any channels where um, you think that it's like non-stationary behavior where the F changes over time? Okay, so the question is, do there exist non-stationary channels? And the answer is, hell yeah. Um, the, the noise level changes with time. If you've got a mobile phone, the signal strength is changing as you move around. You just move your phone a few centimeters and the signal is strength is changing. So the signal to noise is changing. So, so, so your question is, can we cope with that? Can we make codes that cope with non-stationarity? And the answer is yes, there's uh, hundreds of papers on non-stationary channels. The standard way of coping with it is a sort of dinosaur approach, as you could imagine. But there are modern approaches, which is what these fountain codes are, are all about. Um, fountain codes are, are in there, and there is advocacy in there of the idea we should be using fountain codes as a sensible way of coping with these um, channels that have a time-varying noise level. Another name for these time-varying noise levels is called fade. They call it fading. And so you have channel models that include fading. And that's very relevant to mobile phones in, in particular, and probably digital radio as well. Was there a last question? Yes. Um, which one of those books are you referring to as blue? Okay. <laughs> the, the question is, which book is blue? The answer is, it's the green one. <laughs> um, it's called Cambridge Blue, this, this color. So the, the green book is, is blue. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. When we, we have a discrete disc random variable and we are, we are uh, estimating back it from, from the measurements. Uh, so uh, there should be strong connections to, to estimation theory. And for example, if we assume a continuous random variable, then information theory can, can tell us some bounds about uh, what, what the errors that, that we are making in the estimation would be. Yes, so the comment was that there must surely be connections between information theory and estimation theory. It must be possible to create mathematical bounds on the probability of error. So if someone invents an encoder and a decoder, we must be able to make statements about the probability of some particular number of errors occurring, and that the overall system will make some number of errors. And the answer is absolutely yes. Information theory is absolutely stuffed with people who are doing Statistics, basically. They're doing calculations of what the probability of error of a system will be, or they're calculating bounds on the probability of error. And they're very good at, at making bounds. They, they, they are a community of bound makers. It, so that's, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely right. Yes? Have there been, well, there probably is, but can you give examples where the incongruent decoders are 
Okay, so the question is, do there exist encoders and decoders that are stochastic? And um, you can certainly invent one. Uh, the, your homework problem, remember, is invent a code and a decoder and work out its performance. So feel free to invent a stochastic one. The answer, as far as I know, is that there's no deployed system in real use. Uh, I can't think of one that has a stochastic element in the encoder or the decoder. But there are a lot of funky ideas, and, and so don't feel limited in how exciting your answer to the homework problem is. It, it, if you come up with a wild idea, you may well find it's uh, a profitable thing to, to do. Um, it's the, the, this revolution I described that happened in the 1990s, all of the key innovators who came up with these new developments were from outside coding theory. So those sort of wacky ideas are definitely um, uh, encouraged uh, and fruitful. Can you add the serial? Would it be good to have a stochastic? <laughs> OK. The question was, if the channel is adversarial, then would stochastic be a good idea? Well, if the channel were adversarial, we would have to have a complete new discussion of what we would do. Um, and maybe something stochastic might help. But that, that's a whole extra topic. Information theory, according to Shannon, was roughly divided into three bits. Noisy channel coding, data compression, and cryptography which is the world where someone's being adversarial with you and you want to keep secrets and, and so forth. I'm not going to talk about cryptography um, in these two lectures, but I'll, I'm aiming to do the other two bits. Yes? Uh, can we spend some, some time on the next lecture about, about connections of uh, information theory and error bounds for learning? Error bounds for learning connected to information theory. OK, that's a, a challenge to me to, to show that everything is connected. I'll see what I can do, but I, I can't promise that I can uh, demonstrate that, that connection in a useful way. All right, I think we should wrap up there. The uh, reception is at 6 p.m. In, in Churchill. See you there. <laughs>